I gave John most of my height as a present. I love your pastors. Thank you. And I love being with you all and developing a relationship over these many years. And I was kind of reminiscing this morning because um, Pastor Bill Sanders asked me um, September 22nd, 1985, so I'd, I, we, Liz and I had been with Betty Basil at that time for just a few months. Um, we, had, we had come up through the church, and there's so much I want to tell you, because my first youth pastor is right there. That's Tom Flora, and, and he, had, he had the cutest sister that I could never remember her name, and every week I would ask, what is your name? And, and every week she'd tell me Liz, and every week I'd forget. But I knew Tom's name. He was my youth pastor. But he had a really cute sister. And now after uh, he's let me borrow her for almost 41 years as my wife. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> oh. So we grew up. I grew up in Eugene, graduated from Willamette High School, and moved down to Myrtle Point, and I was looking for a church home, and I couldn't, I'm, there's some boring churches. <sighs> and I, I, I thought, you know, I had a little bit of fire in me, so I wanted to find a place with a little bit of fire, and there was just, I couldn't find a church. And I had met, I had met a couple, now, George is here today, George Lyons, it's George and Betty Lyons. Um, but Russell and Betty Basil had just come home from South Africa, and they were having dinner at the restaurant that my parents owned. It was Tubby's Restaurant in Myrtle Point, the place for great steaks, seafood, and chicken dinners. <laughs> and I was a server. Back then it was called a waiter, but I was a server. And I served them, and I watched them do something at the end of their prayer. Russell took his hand, her hand, Betty's hand, and kissed it after the prayer. And I, I mentioned, I said, someday when I find a girl, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to kiss her hand after I pray. I didn't know they were pastors at that time. I just thought that was really cool. And my dad, being the mailman, he was also the mailman, was doing his mail route. And he was... Right down the street, you could just to the left, you could see the front of Myrtle Point Christian Assembly. And we used to have a little um, bench that sat out front. And a little lady was sitting on the bench. And she was someone that I served coffee to every day at the restaurant. Her name was Mary Pitzer. And Mary kind of drug her foot. She, her hand was a little withered or her face was withered and and, and yet every day she'd come in, she loved on me. Oh, Mike, it's so good to see you. Let me have my coffee with three creamers. And I, I'd give her that. It was 25 cents for a, a coffee. And, I, and she probably drank several cups of those coffees for 25 cents. And then she'd always leave me a dime. And I, I found a dime on my chair just a few minutes ago. So someone was listening in the first service. Uh, I got my tip. I got my tip for the first message. Um, <laughs> <laughs> either that or some kid dropped it or anyway I just thought it was cool but here's Mary sitting up there on that porch and I said to my dad dad what church is that <laughs> oh son you don't want to go to that church <laughs> they swing from the rafters in there <laughs> now for a teenager who's wanting a little livelier church than what I'd found, that sounded just like the ticket. And so I made my plans to go, and, and by the time Sunday got there, my whole family went. And we basically filled up the si this side over here, and my dad won the gift for having the most kids in church that day because it was Father's Day. And I found my family. Found my family. Father's Day, 1980. 80. 1980. That was a little while ago. And that, that became my family. And out of that, I got a, a mama. <laughs> I got a brother, another brother, and a wife. You know, I found a lot of good stuff there. 
good church. <laughs> it, was, it was amazing what happened in my young life at that church and what happened in my heart and in my soul. And it's, so I was reminiscing. I got to get back to this. You talk long enough, you remember what you were saying. Um, <laughs> September 22nd, 1985, Tom was uh, pastoring in Myrtle Creek, and Bill Sanders asked if I would do the fellowship meeting, and that was kind of my first real get-to-know-Bill Sanders. Now, I knew Bill Sanders uh, from camps and different things before then, but this was my first adult uh, get-to-know-Bill Sanders, and, and he told me, you know, you better preach, and you better preach short, and I, I was already short, but he meant like this much. He meant you better do it, and you better do it quick. Um, and so I learned from that, that if I was going to preach, I better preach quick. Well, last service, I looked over at the clock, and I'm blah, 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 I better hurry because I'm going to be over time. But John did not whip me after service. He was very gracious to me, and um, we just had a great time. And I've been sitting in the service, and I just feel like there's a lot that's happening in this room this morning and while you were worshiping in the second service, I was having a hard time really getting into worship, not because I wasn't enjoying the worship, because I was, but I was just feeling these downloads, and I kept feeling like the Lord was redirecting my steps this morning uh, as I was getting ready to, you know, not prepare, but getting ready to preach. I'm like, Liz goes, what are you doing? Has God changed your message? I go, I don't know. Maybe. I go, but whatever I have you do, you're going to do the same thing you did last time. So Liz is going to come share in a little bit like she did last time. But I'm not sure exactly where we're going yet. So I just want to, for a moment, just allow the Lord uh, to speak to us. And I, I really believe, I, my heart is so full of stuff that I, we could go all day. And I, that's not a problem. But I really want to give you what the word of the Lord is for this service today in this room. And um, so let's just wait on the Lord for a moment. Everybody just be still and just wait. Hallelujah. Want us to go ahead and go to Psalm 25. And let's just start at verse 1. And while you're turning, it's, it's really awesome because... Not only do, do I have my pastor and my youth pastor and my wife and two brother-in-laws and a sister-in-law, but also um, I've got some of my previous leadership at, from Chehalis, Washington here this morning, Paul and Jean Friesen sitting on the second row here. Uh, they served so faithfully with us. We were in Chehalis for 11 years, and they served faithfully. We were youth pastors for three with Wanda Stretch. Y'all remember Wanda? I had two mamas, Betty and Wanda, and got to serve both of them uh, as pa my pastors. And Paul and Jean were in the church before we got there, but they served so faithfully alongside of us for those eight years. And it was just such a joy to see them this morning. Uh, we thought about them earlier the week. We were riding on a train um, up through Klamath Falls and knew that they had lived there, but they've moved to Eugene, and they drove up today down down today sorry Texas. when you're down in texas everything's down but so you got to think about it a little bit we've pastored in the northwest in oregon in myrtle point as youth pastors eugene as pastors and then up in chehalis and then we were down in redding california before we went to texas we were in bella vista the beautiful view of bella vista and now we've been in texas for 17 years um and Liz said the other day, maybe we're Texans now. And I said, until we get home, and then we're Oregonians. <laughs> and especially if the Ducks win. I'm gloating. Yes, I'm gloating. Okay. 
I'm not going to rub it in as bad today, this service, John. Um, there are some people that are Beaver fans. and I'm <laughs> Okay. All right. All right. Now I know what I'm preaching on. No, I just need to. <laughs> the Duck fans were very prominent in the first service. Do we have any Duck fans in the room? <laughs> All right. That's good. See, I, I actually can get a little, you know, I have in my church, I have a uh, Alabama fans, I have LSU fans, I have Texas Longhorn fans, I've got A&M fans, and I'm, I'm gaining more and more Duck fans all the time. So everywhere I pastor, I try to not only get people saved, but get them on the side of the Oregon Duck. So um, I, I never, never changed allegiance, even when I pastored in Husky Land or down in California, and especially in all those schools down in Texas. Um, still a Duck fan. Okay, enough silliness. Verse 1. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, I trust in you. Let me not be ashamed. Let not my enemies triumph over me. Indeed, let no one and I want you to see these three words, who waits, or four words, who waits on you. Let no one who waits on you be ashamed. No one who waits on you be ashamed. Let those be ashamed who deal treacherously without cause. Show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. On you I will wait all the day. On you I will wait all the day. I'm going to talk to you about waiting on God, waiting on the Lord in just a moment, because I believe it's a source of, of true power. It's where I'm finding the most anointing for prayer right now is just waiting in the presence of the Lord, waiting on God, waiting for God to show up, waiting for God to minister, waiting for God to speak, waiting for God to bring instructions, waiting for God to bring provisions, waiting for God to come. But there's another source that we've Liz and I have been drinking from and it's biblical meditation, and I want her just to come and talk about biblical meditation for a moment, and then I'm going to come back and talk to you about waiting on God. Give Liz a big hand! Thank you. <laughs> I just wanted to correct one thing. I am not borrowed. <laughs> You give things back that are borrowed. <laughs> and I'm not going back. Yeah, I'm not going back. I love, I love my brothers, but <laughs> I, like, I love Mike a little more. So <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> I started to get a little offended when he said I was borrowed, but then I will not be offended. I will not be offended. <laughs> I will not carry that offense because <laughs> I know he didn't mean it. <laughs> but it was fun to correct him anyway. <laughs> Biblical meditation is awesome. You know, the world has stolen that word meditation. The world has lied to us and told us that meditation is emptying your mind. But you know what? God didn't make your mind empty, and there's no way to empty it. So as much as you try to empty it, there's still stuff in there. <laughs> but true meditation is filling your mind with the Word of God. 
And it's time to flip the script on the devil and take that word back and teach ourselves and, one, and each other what it really means. And it is basically just thinking on what God has said. So as you read the word of God, then you think about it. What did that say? What does it mean? What is God trying to say to me? In 2 Timothy 2.7, it says, Reflect on what I am saying, for the Lord will give you insight into all of this. And that's exactly what happens when you meditate on the word of God. You gain insight. You learn things. You see things that you've never seen before. And in Psalms 19.14, it says, May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight. O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. And that's what happens when you truly meditate on the word of God. You begin speaking it. The, God's words begin to come out of your mouth as you meditate, as you think about it, as you chew on it. And you might say, well, how do you do it? Well, we found a model from many years ago. I don't remember the year, but. Somebody else came up with this model long ago. And it's just taking a portion of scripture and you write down the question, who is God in the text? So you see, it doesn't matter how much you read. You know, years ago, you know, I felt like I had to read multiple scriptures every day. But I don't always have time to do that, right? We don't have time to do that every day. And then you just don't do it, and then you feel guilty about it. And you go days and days and days without reading the Bible then. And then it's like, oh, I really should get back to that. But in this model, you don't have to miss a day. Because all you, if you just read one scripture, you can ask these questions. And you can gain insight, and you can hear from the Lord. So don't let the enemy keep you from reading the word every day because you think you don't have time. Because, And we can listen now. We don't even have to sit down and read. We can listen. We have technology that allows us to listen. But I do like to sit down and read it. And I write down these questions every day. Who is God in the text? Is it Jesus that's mentioned? Is it the Father? Is it the Son of God? Is it the Anointed One? And many times, it's many things. And it's amazing. You know, you read 10 scriptures, and it's like, oh my gosh. God has mentioned 10 different ways in, the, in this portion of scripture. And then... I write those things down, all the things that God is. And then I write down, what has God done in the text? And, you know, sometimes I read it again. And so in this model, sometimes less is more. <laughs> and so I'll read through it again. And, and what did he do? Did he heal someone? Did he speak to someone? Was he just in their presence? Did he love them? Whatever it is that God did, I write it down. Then who am I in the text? Who can I relate with in this text? You know, am I reading about David? Can I relate with that, what David was doing in the text? Or Peter or Timothy? Today, I read in John where... Timothy was telling the other disciples, because he wasn't there when Jesus appeared to them. And he wasn't believing them. And he said, I won't believe until I put my fingers in his wounds. I won't believe till I see him. And it said that eight days later that Jesus appeared just for Timothy. A lot of times we focus on, oh, Timothy the doubter. And yes, he did doubt. 
But Jesus appeared just for him. He is a personal God. And he will speak to us personally as we meditate on his word. And that just touched me this morning. I was just like, because that was something I had never really noticed before. Wow. He knew that Timothy needed that. And he appeared to him just for him and said, touch Touch the holes in my hands. Put your hand in my side. And then he said, now believe. But those who believe without seeing are blessed even more. So stop your doubting. Believe and keep on believing. Never stop believing. So that was my meditation today. (laughs) So who am I in the text? And just write it down. Sometimes it's, I'm loved. I am loved in the text. Or maybe I'm the doubter. Whatever it is, just write it down. And then, what must I obey? And I learned recently that in the Hebrew, there's really no word for obey, but it's hear and do. So what must I obey, hear, do? Recently, I've changed it. Now, when I started doing this, I would write, what must I obey in the text? But now I'm writing now, what must I hear and do in the text? And there is where we can apply what we have read. Like today, don't doubt, Liz. Believe and never stop believing. And so... Just try it. It'll change your life. It really will. And, and even if it's just five minutes. And maybe you just start there. We've on a, been on a health journey, and we're learning about micro habits. If you can only do one push-up, then do one push-up. And in six months, I got to ten. <laughs> so start with five minutes. And you'll want to do 10 the next day. So in the word of God even, do start with micro habits and it will grow into something great. I think what's awesome is this is a very simple way to get to the source. Get to the source of what God has for you. No, don't settle for second best. Don't settle for getting leftovers. Get to the source. And I talked about the, the Sacramento River earlier today. If you go to the Sacramento River in Sacramento, it's not something you'd really want to drink out of. Go up a little farther north to Redding, and the Sacramento River is beautiful, but still not very drinkable. It's very cold. The water's freezing cold in Redding. But you go up a little farther, get up into the Shasta Mountain, and go to the source. And that's what biblical meditation has done for Liz and I. Yes, we've been in ministry for 40-some years. But there's been something of the heaven's realm that's been released to us over the last few years as we've been doing this that I, can't, I, won't, give you, I won't give it back. It's taken us to a a new place. I want to drink from the source. And that's what waiting on God is also all about. And I I think that today, I I really feel like that as a church, you, you are on a precipice of there's a desire for revival. There's a desire for God to pour out his spirit. There's a desire to touch your city. There's a desire to go deeper And then there's times where God says, let me take you deeper. So that as I take you deeper, you can go farther. And the whole idea of what I'm preaching today in the early service was on great grace. And our grace comes from a loving heavenly father in a vertical relationship. Everything happens this way with God. He just pours out his grace on us. And then we take it out this way. We take it horizontal. So I I really feel and sense that 
today, he wants to take you to the source of that place in him. I thought maybe I was supposed to take you to the Song of Songs and just let you hear the words of Solomon and the Shulamite and the love that is between them so that you could see that great grace relationship, that secret place with God. I learned how to pray from my mama who's sitting on the second row. She impacted my life as I would listen to her pray. I would come into church and and she'd usually, we had old metal chairs and she'd usually be over on one of those chairs on this side and her head just buried in the chair. And as soon as I come in the building, I could hear her praying. And I'd get as close as I could without being weird and just listen to her pray. And I was just captivated by my pastor's prayers. And then after a while, they became my prayers. And then I had this. I was, I was learning from this, but it helped me to connect to this. And because of those prayers, it, it opened doors for my life. I wouldn't be the district superintendent of the South Central part of the United States and Grace International if it wasn't for my prayer life. I know that because that's what brought me to Texas. Um, I had been asked to pray in a combined committee meeting down in Long Beach, California. Steve Riggle had said, Mike, pray. <laughs> and I prayed. And it wasn't too long after that. He's like, Mike, what you doing? Um, we got this Wednesday night prayer service and we baptized a couple hundred people last Wednesday and during the Wednesday night prayer service, and we really needed a pastor for our prayer ministry. And we were in Reading, and, and he said, what do you all think about coming to Texas, being our pastor of prayer? And prayed about it for about a minute and said, okay. Amazing things happen by saying yes right there. Liz and I were a part of the first prayer meeting ever held in the uh, United Nations. 200 prayer leaders from around the world were invited to the United Nations to be a part of the first prayer meeting ever held in 2007, right around September 11th time. The nation of Uganda is who invited us. Think about that. We went to the United Nations in New York City, right, America. It wasn't America that invited us to come to the United Nations. It was Uganda. Because Uganda at that season, if you remember, was an incredible revival. And we had made friends with Jackson Sinyanga, who was part of the great transformation of what was happening in Uganda. In fact, Jackson would... Was, he became a good friend, and he talked real high sometimes, but, you know, he gets so excited about Jesus. And he was telling a story about how the church had just a handful of people, and Idi Amin had been oppressing the Ugandans and killing Christians and burning their churches, so they went out into the bush to pray at night. And it was in that bush where they prayed that they started sounding like bees in the night. At home, we have crickets and bullfrogs and, and, when you, and that other bug that makes a lot of noise. And we go out of our house, and it's just so noisy. And we live out in the country, and it's just so cool. And then all of a sudden, it'll stop for a second. And I can imagine Jackson Sinyanga and some of these other brothers out in the fields praying. And, and when a little bit of religious liberty came to Uganda and Jackson started his church, they started with six people. Now, I think last I heard, like 40 or 50,000 people as a part of their church. They were part of the true transformation that was happening in Uganda. 
So here we are getting to pray with these people. God was opening doors for Liz and I to go places we never thought we could go. And it was in the middle of that, after being in, at Grace for about 10 years, that the city of Houston, uh, KSBJ Radio, asked Liz and I to come and be the pastors of prayer for KSBJ Radio, the largest Christian radio station in the country. And a um, million listeners. In fact, there's times when, you know, pop stations are usually the top 10 stations in a, in a, in a market. Recently, KSBJ has, has beat the, the pop markets. So they're not just top in Christian market, but top in the pop markets as well. And, you know, we've got all of, all of the, all of the, all of the, then you know, every kind of music you can imagine in Houston, and KSBJ has been coming in in the top two or three in Houston as a, as a station, not just a Christian station. So we had over a million listeners, and the opportunity to pray for those listeners and to develop prayer ministries for these areas. And so I left the radio station in 2017 to go pastor Church on the Lake. And it was such a joy to be at the radio station for those years. But the work that I did there is still going on. We started 24-7 prayer in the greater Houston area, and 600,000 of the population of Houston is covered with 24-7 prayer. So since January 1 of 2016, Every minute of every day of every hour has been covered in prayer in those areas. And I went to go pastor a church, and it's still going on. It's still happening. So the other day, other day now being a year and a half ago, um, the, my successor calls me and says, Mike, what are you doing? I said, I'm pastoring up in Livingston, Church on the Lake. He goes, what do you think about joining our steering committee? And what he did is he brought all the 12 prayer leaders of the greater Houston area together. And I get to be right back where I was when I was pastoring at the radio station. And we're in the middle of watching God cover the entire region. I'm not just Houston, but from Beaumont, Texas, to Corpus Christi, Texas, to Waco, Texas, and all the way around. And if you ever listen to Dutch Sheets, Dutch, Dutch Sheets talk about a dome of prayer over Texas, that's it. That's what we're doing. We're living that prophecy right now. And we were ready to really roll at the beginning of the year. And all of a sudden we heard this, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> you, you've been at a traffic stop, right? And you're waiting to cross on foot and is wait, wait. Well, God put a weight on us. But then all of a sudden in the waiting, we begin to realize that in the waiting, God was showing us a strategy and it was a strategy we had all along. We want the presence of God to invade that area. And when I just said that just now, I know that's what you want. You want the presence of God to invade this area. Amen? You want the presence of God to come to the Sutherland area, to this Southern Oregon area, and turn it around. My God can turn it around. Because he turns things around. I could use so many analogies from the game yesterday, but I won't. The one that we won. <laughs> okay. But, so, we started waiting on God this year on January 3rd. Liz and I started biblical meditation a while back, and, and Wycliffe is the one that actually created the model for this waiting on God um, back in, wow, a long time ago. All of you know Wycliffe Bible Translators, John Wycliffe, I think 1400s, somewhere in there, be, just prior to the Reformation. Um, so this model is one you can use and you can trust. 
And what it did is it brought us to that place from Psalm 1 and from Joshua 1 that if you do this, you'll find success. You'll be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit and in its season. Have you ever thought what it would be like to be, I heard this word wellspring, and a wellspring means a constant spring, not, not a spring of water, but a living in a constant spring. Isn't that revival? That we're living in a perpetual spring? Isn't that what 24-7 prayer is all about? Is bringing us into the presence of God so that we can live in a perpetual spring to where it's always springtime. Oh, no winter, no hot summer, no fires in Oregon. Still want to have the flat, the leaves change colors because we don't get to see that in Texas, so it's so nice to come home to Oregon, so I'm sorry you can't have it here, but um, we'll take the perpetual spring in Texas, and you guys keep having your four seasons. Waiting on God brings you to the source to hear God's voice. As a son or a daughter of the Father, there's no greater thing that any of us as pastors, ministers, leaders can do it's not so much about what am I saying in my prayers now, it's what I'm hearing. What am I hearing God saying? I want to hear his voice. I want to know what he's telling me to do. And on January 3rd, when we started waiting on God, and let me just explain what that means, we now are meeting at 6 a.m. every morning for prayer at 6 a.m. by Zoom all over the greater Houston area. And we'll average 90 folks on a Zoom call. And we'll read a devotional from, um, <laughs> huh? Yeah, Waiting on God. What's his name? Thank you. You were listening. I appreciate it. Andrew Murray wrote this over 120 years ago. He's a South African. And we have a South African on our steering committee who translated it into modern English. And you can get it on... Um, Amazon, Waiting on God, Andrew Murray. And basically we'll read, like today is the 25th, you'd read the 25th devotion together, waiting in between paragraphs. And then at the end of the, the, the devotion, you just wait. It's kind of weird to be on a Zoom call, leading a Zoom call, and, okay, now we're going to take 15 minutes and we're just going to be silent. But can I just say, on January 3rd, I weighed 200 pounds, and today I weigh 100 and somewhere between 145 and 150. I was wearing a 48 short jacket. This is a 40. My health has been restored while I've been waiting on God. Um, it's been awesome. We started a school of leadership development at our church this year. We have 45 paid students that are all developing, and it's amazing what's happening with their lives. They're growing at an exponential rate. We've built a church in India and South Africa this year in our church. Um, we're getting ready to plant a church out of our church, just 50 miles from our church, and it's going to be Church on the Lake Trinity, and uh, it's pretty cool because you know the curls, you know the curls, I know Betty knows the curls. David and Red are one of our pastors in, in Cedar Park, Texas, and now we've asked Daniel Curl to be our church planting pastor and to help us plant a church in Trinity, Trinity Church on the Lake. This, we've went to two services since we've been waiting on God. We've added 10 new ministries in the church while we've been waiting on God. I, I wait on God, and it's really awkward, like I said. You know, I've got all these faces looking back at me. We're just waiting on God, close my eyes, see if they're looking at me. And some days as I'm waiting, I hear instructions. Now, 
isn't that good? Like, if, if you're praying and you just say all the words, then how do you know what God wants you to do? But if you pray and you listen, and then God gives you instructions, then you have something he wants you to do. You hear, and then you do. Hear, O Israel. That's what Liz was referring to. You hear and you do. You hear and you do. And as you hear and you do, then God begins to open amazing doors. And that's what I've just referenced to you, not only in my own personal life, but in our church. We're just watching God, and he's using our little church. Now, I love this church because it feels like I'm home. So I want you to know, Church on the Lake looks just like the Father's house. We're like, like you guys. We have two services. We have a church about this size. We're not a giant church. But can I tell you right now, Church on the Lake is leading the charge in the greater Houston area in waiting on God. The little church by the lake, which is way out of town, is leading on Sunday morning and on Friday morning. Our church is leading the call for the greater Houston area. How could that happen? Because I learned how to pray for my pastor. And prayer has opened doors in my life. But now there's this new thing. And we used to just think Brother Maul was just saying Jesus, Jesus, Jesus all the time. Because that's how he prayed. But he was waiting on God. I learned that from Brother Maul. Amen. Is it possible that we preach that same care meeting, fellowship meeting that time? What is your name? Yes, Wes. It is. You are the man. Yes. That's awesome. Haven't seen him for years. Awesome. I was just that kid. Anyway. I want you to think about what God can do through you if you start drinking from the source and you start listening to the source. We need the word of God, the written word of God, the logos. The logos has to become rhema. It has to become living. And we need to hear the word of God. We need to hear him speaking to us. What greater thing could someone do who's leading God's people than to teach them to hear the voice of God? Right? Because once you hear the voice of God, nobody can take that away from you. Nobody can take that voice that he speaks because the sheep know his voice. So I want you just for a moment just to close your eyes. Those that wait upon the Lord shall never be ashamed. Those that wait on the Lord can afford to wait because you're going to receive an inheritance. As sons and daughters of the Father, as royal priests, may we learn to hear the voice of God. And so I just want us, I'm going to get quiet. I, I keep talking, but I want us to just be quiet for a moment. And then I'm just going to ask you a couple of questions. And then I'll, after those questions, I'm going to have them come and do some music behind me here. And we're going to just go before the Lord as we close out this service. Just listen.
There's a few important things. I believe that he speaks to us often. Often when we're reading the scriptures, and as Liz referenced, who am I in the text? I believe God is always trying to restore our uh, truest identity. And we know from the scriptures that we are sons and daughters of the Father. We know that we're royal priests. But sometimes there's those special things that he speaks to our heart. And I just want to give God a moment to speak that into your heart. Who are you? What is God saying you are today? And so just, I'm going to take one moment here. What is God saying you are today? Just listen to his voice. And I hope that you've heard something. I hope he spoke something into your very depth of your spirit. In January of 1981, while standing on a rooftop in Madras, India, I just heard these words, Joshua 3.7. The next morning I opened my Bible and read that verse, and it said, This day... Have I begun to magnify thee in the sight of all of Israel? And as I was with Moses, so shall I be with you. I felt on that day that God was calling me to be a Joshua. So I'm a son, I'm a royal priest, and I'm a Joshua. He's reconfirmed that to me so many times I can't even tell you to let, him, to let me know that he's with me in that calling. And the understanding of that is to help people to gain their inheritance and drive out all of the false gods in our lives. And right now, that's kind of what I'm after for you, that you would begin to walk into your true inheritance as sons and daughters of the Father, and that you would drive out every false identity, every false thing that is lying to you, that's telling you that you're no good, that's telling you you can't do it, every false thing that has been speaking to you, you've got to drive those things out of your inheritance. Drive those things out of your life. Don't listen to them anymore. And the only time and the only way you know that is when you get to the source where you're actually hearing what God is saying from his word and what he's speaking to your heart. And so right now, what is he saying you are? And what does he want you to do? Who are you and what does he want you to do? So just for another moment. What does he want you to do? And you all can start playing any time now. You are way maker, miracles. Out in the darkness, my God, that is sitting You are.
So, Father, I pray that all over this house right now, that by the Spirit of God, you would begin to move deep inside of us. Lord, that you would begin to move something out of the way that maybe has been holding and blocking, God, your voice to our own hearts and to our own minds. Lord, we want to hear your voice today. We want to know you. And God, we want to know you in a new way. We want to know you in a new power. We want to know you, God, in the sweet anointing that goes with it. And so, Father, right now I'm asking that you begin to move across this room and that you begin to speak to different hearts. And Lord, even if we didn't quite track with what Mike was saying this morning, God, right now there's something of the Spirit of God that is drawing from us, and it's pulling us, and we can sense that there's something new and fresh that you're wanting to do in our lives. Not something of yesterday, but something of now, brand new. A new thing that God is wanting to open and release in your spirit and in your life. And so, Lord, I pray, let every one of those barriers, every one of those hindrances, every one of those things that would block what you're wanting to do in each one of our lives, move them out of the way now, God. And, Lord, I pray that you begin to open our spirit and we begin to rise and worship and praise. So let's all stand just for a moment and let's join in because he's the way maker. Maker, miracle work, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are the way maker, miracle That is who you are. 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 You are the rainmaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. how long you've been a Christian, no matter how long you've been following Christ, I sense there's something new, and I just want to call you to that today. I want to call you to come and to open your heart to God and say, God, I want to go to new places with you. I want want to experience a fresh revelation of you. I want to know you in ways I've never known you before. I want to learn to wait upon you. I want to learn to meditate on your word and get to the source so that the relationship I have with you gets stronger and deeper so that I can go wider and touch my community. So as we go back into this song, I'm just going to call you out. I just want you to start coming. You may not understand everything that's going on right now, but you feel a tug. You feel God saying, there's something fresh I'm wanting to do in your life. There's something new I want to do in your church. There's something new I want to do in your future. My God, that is who you are. You are the way 